All right, we'll get going here. Welcome to the Edmonds Waterfront Center and the latest in our author and lecture series, Sailing Adventure to Tahiti. I am Teresa Ripple. I'm the publisher of My Edmonds News, and we have been helping to sponsor these events. And I am so excited about this one because uh, we actually ran a story on uh, Daniel and Dave's adventures a few years ago, but now I get to see the inside scoop, so I'm really looking forward to that. But um, let's go to the introductions. Uh, as you may have guessed, they're twins. I'm sure nobody can tell. Breaking news. Right. Okay, we'll start with Daniel. He's worked 38 years in the nonprofit. Daniel Johnson, I guess I didn't even do the last name. Sorry about that. Daniel Johnson has worked 38 years in the nonprofit sector. He has a master's degree in social work and community organization and nonprofit management, management from the UW. He's worked for a range of organizations. His longest tenure was the Boys and Girls Club of Clubs in King County, where he served as CEO for 12 years. And of course, now he is at the Waterfront Center, and we're so lucky to have him. Uh, during seven years of nonprofit consulting, he focused on fundraising, marketing, board development, strategic planning, change management, and leadership. What a guy. Daniel has raised more than $100 million in capital funding for community infrastructure. Considers his work social entrepreneurship. And now he is CEO of the Evans Waterfront Center, which, as we know, is this wonderful hub for multi generational, multicultural programs and activities. And I guess we can hope that Dave can follow. I'm not going to try. All right, I have to turn to Dave. Sorry. Well, you're both great guys. <laughs> I love this guy. <laughs> We're going to copy a free ticket to the next one. Sorry. A little bit of the technical difficulty. Okay. All right. Dave. Dave. Let me see. Sorry. There we go. Dave earned his bachelor's degree in psychology from UW with a minor in history and teaching certificate. He taught English in Japan for over a year and returned to Seattle where he was a substitute teacher in the Shoreline School District. With limited opportunities in teaching, he shifted to his passion to boating, and I see a theme here. His first job was at West Marine as a salesperson, advancing to store manager and then to multi-store management. He led the opening of the first 18 stores on the East Coast and later became the director of retail marketing in California. And then he was hired as VP of Sales and Marketing for Blue Sea Systems, which now is one of 18 marine brands at Navico. Navico. I like Navico, right? Navico. Navico Group, a division of Brunswick. He's held roles of VP of Product Development. Okay, now you can start lording this over. Daniel here. He does. VP, <laughs> VP of Product Development, VP of Sales and Marketing, and his interim VP of Marketing and plans to retire in June to find his next passion. So, let's get started. I just want to say this is actually the global headquarters for Edmonds Waterfront Center. Oh, so, okay. it's not that it's a competition. Of marketing. And while I have the microsecond, I just want to thank you. Teresa Whipple um, is one of the most trusted voices we have in this area. Um, you are a treasure here. And, um, you know, I know you hate it when I say this, but she was Citizen of the Year two years ago. If you were Citizen of the Year, wouldn't you wear the sash? I got a brick. <laughs> no, seriously, they put a brick in the museum on Plaza, that, which is fine. It's great, actually. That lasts a long time, longer than a sash, probably. Anyway. Do you want a sash? We're getting no, a sash. No, no. It's fine. We're good. Okay, so we're going to stand because we're going to be like the CNN people, or maybe that's the wrong station to use. We're, we're going to stand to use the, you know, kind of that look. So here we go. So let's have a conversation about your childhood and what inspired this travel to Tahiti. You are 17 years old, and you decided you were going to build an ocean-going sailboat. What made you think you could do that? Do you want to take that? The operative word is think. We didn't think. We just thought it was a good idea. It was actually at 16 when we got the idea, and we started the boat at 17. And uh, 
I think that we had built a boat when we were 13, so we definitely could build an ocean-going boat and take it to the South Pacific. <laughs> I think, in part, one of our big lessons learned was that if you have a vision and it's exciting, you can include people in that and they'll buy into the vision. And so we had um, sur surrounded ourselves with people who loved what we were trying to do and they were going to help the, the teenagers. And so uh, an important person in this whole mix was um, our woodshop teacher, Vern Morgus. And he was um, an ex-Marine. Um, he played the harmonica. He um, was a master diver. And he also built the mold for the largest monohull fiberglass hull in the world at the time. Fiberglass was pretty new. So when, we, when he learned that we were interested in possibly building a boat, and he made this offer to us, basically saying, listen, it's going to cost you, was it $11,000? $500 down. And he said, if you want to stop at any point, I will buy it back from you. But just for the materials you have in it. So, and then he, we showed up the first day, ready to start building the boat, and he handed us brooms. And so we started sweeping out the shop and getting the shop. And then interestingly, um, the next thing you do is you polish the inside of the mold. You know, because, and then the first thing you do really is you're painting it. So you paint the boat before you even have it. But anyway, we became, um, you know, we learned along the way. He loved teaching us, and there were um, other builders around us that we could steal ideas from. Okay. Anything you want to add? I don't want to leave you out. I don't think I need to add anything. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay, one more thing. When we started at the day one, uh, Dale, our brother, who's over here, he came and helped us sweep. So, <laughs> thank you. In fact, I should say, you know, say, we have fact checkers in the room. Because, you know, and so we have, um, first of all, my wife, Elaine, who I met when I was 19, so she's been a part of this whole thing. Elaine, we've been married uh, 40 years in August, and so she's a fact checker. My brother, Dale, who's, you'll meet him later in here, my sister, Deb, and our niece, Hannah. Those are the ones who can really weigh in on this stuff. Okay, so speaking Not of family. keep the rest of us from weighing in. <laughs> That's my brother-in-law. <laughs> he brings, I find if you bring your own hecklers, it always, it always goes better. Okay. okay, so speaking of family. Family. What did your parents think of this idea? Were they in the picture? Or some people say, did you have parents? <laughs> it's, it's a great question, and our parents, the way that they parented was not, I mean, it's basically, you have to show up for dinner, and uh, they were quite supportive. They never said, you shouldn't do something. When we wanted to dig a hole to China, we, uh, these, my dad would say, okay, who's, where are you, what are you going to do with all the dirt? You're going to need shifts. You're going to have to think this thing through. So when we came bounding up the stairs to say, we're going to Tahiti, Dad said, uh, well, how are you going to get there? Well, you own a boat, and you can't afford a boat. And we just started working through the process of knocking down barriers. So. But basically, they were pathologically supportive. And so I don't remember them ever saying no. In fact, there was at one point where we decided at 12 that we were going to sell blackberries all summer and earn enough to buy a hang glider. Because that was an awesome idea. We're picking out the sale cover of uh, the sales. Um, and uh, then my mom didn't say no, but she laid on top of the plans was um, a Family Circle magazine article where you could buy plans for a sailboat for $2. And so we, it was diversion. We just you know, forgot the hang glider, and then we were on our back. <laughs> So she probably thought that was maybe safer or something. Somehow. Yeah. Joke's on her. <laughs> And, and you know, this was back when you didn't, there was no technology, there was, and we'll get to that later. Yes, we would. It's amazing, really. Um, so, why Tahiti? Because you originally were going to go to Alaska, right? So, we had a 32 foot Kettenberg sailboat, and we were out on July um, 4th, 1976, and we were planning to take our Kettenberg up the Inland Passage to Alaska. And we were going to do that after we graduated from high school. And that would be an adventure. 
And then we started thinking that it's so cold up there. So then we started thinking about warm places and somebody blurted out Tahiti. And that was one of the most exotic places we could ever imagine. We didn't know if it was an island or a country or a city, but we wanted to go there. And so we all started just chanting, we're going to Tahiti, like shouting it. And then we went going up to one of our um, partner's house and said, we're going to Tahiti. And his father said, get your head out of the cloud. You, are, you have a job, you're going to school in Bellingham. And so we said, okay. And then we drove up to our family. And then that's when we were shouting, we're going to Tahiti. And Dad said, what a fantastic idea. <laughs> and how did you come up with the money? Was it $11,000 or $10,000? Yeah, it was a lot of easy payment. It was an easy payment plan. Um, and we did sell our Kenberg 32 to help finance it. One of the guys sold their car. We all worked. And we were just, you, um, very interestingly, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, we would just, we needed something and then we would earn the money for it. So we were just kind of doing it as we, we didn't have to have a big chunk on. Yeah. I should add one more thing. Do we have any bankers in the room? <laughs> Local bankers? Because uh, we quickly ran out of money, so we needed to get a loan. So, of course, you go to the local bank, and everybody, every bank wants to loan money to teenagers building a boat that's going to go to South Pacific. What could possibly go wrong? So, actually, it's an advantage of a small town, and so everybody knew my dad, Carl, full of real estate. Carl, if you co signed for it, so all the parents co signed, and uh, then we needed more money. <laughs> so we went back to the bank and uh, we had leverage now because we said we're going to need another $25,000 and they said we can't give you that. Okay, you can have the boat then. <laughs> okay, just sign here. So I think we did that three times. So we did. This work. Ultimately it was a $50,000 loan because we had to borrow enough to make payments while we were on the sailing trip. So fifty thousand back in nineteen seventy nine. Fifty thousand dollars right now is a lot of money. Oh, you're not going to give to a teenager. We kind of had the bankers over a barrel, but they. This is what they did because they there were doubts. So they made us get life insurance because they thought, hey, if they don't succeed, at least we're going to get the loan paid off. <laughs> and I'll tell you, the most unpleasant lunch you're ever going to go to is with the life insurance guy because we were going to taking this out. Burgers. And then we discussed all the different ways we could die on the trip, and he told us what to do with the body and how to you know, and put him in the boat and drag him in the sleeping I remember I'm not eating this burger. <laughs> it was that's what happened, but we had life insurance. Well, I think that's a good segue to the next question, which is did you ever fear for your life when you were on the trip? I told someone, um, kind of always afraid, but sometimes more than others. But um, no, there were definitely times that we were, you know, feared for our life. Um, and we're going to walk you through some of those experiences here. Certainly storms. And sometimes it just kind of, you know, would sink in. We were sitting in the cockpit, waves <laughs> the sides of a two-story building, trying to, you know, kind of rolling. and. We realize that no one knows where we are. We're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, we're not quite sure where we are. It's three miles down to the bottom, and we're in a boat that we built. And so then we started getting a little nervous at different times. And, and we were taking on water that we had to pump every 20 minutes. But before, later. And, and as we were talking before we started, and you were showing me some of these instruments, which I'm sure you'll talk about. Yeah. Um, this was, you did not have satellite navigation, you were navigating by the stars. By the stars. And I mean, and I don't even know how your mother let you go. I just keep thinking back to what I would have done, and I would have never She was a very religious that. person. Um, yeah. 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 I did want to say one other thing about fear. Um, all four partners, so there were four of us, we all had our own specific fear. Um, my fear was seasickness. I got more sick than anyone else, and my fear was that at an important time, moment, I was going to need to make a decision and I would be incapable and someone would be injured. Um, and Dave was our navigator. His fear was that we would miss the tiny little dots on the chart. And you just keep sailing, and we thought an island was supposed to be here, you keep sailing, you run out of food and water. And we then, actually missed a large dot. And then, um, <laughs> Carrie, his fear was that somebody was going to go overboard. And we actually sailed with the boat that had lost somebody overboard, slipped over at night. They took two days to try to find them, they never did. 
because that's what happens. You fall over, you're on watch. Um, and then the other, the fourth was Marty, and he was concerned about shark attacks. And there are magazines out there about shark attacks, and you can just attack after attack. So we had those magazines on board. <laughs> And I know you're going to talk more about this, but I think it's a, a good next question for um, before you start the presentation. But um, how did that experience shape who both of you are today? Because obviously, in that those long bios that I read, you're both very successful people, and I think admired by many. So, uh, do you attribute a lot of your success to that? Those three years on the boat. Dave? Yeah, I, I would have to say that uh, I've never been qualified for the job I've had. And uh, I wasn't qualified to build a boat. I I'm different than Dave. I'm qualified. <laughs> I've got board members. I have board members out here. <laughs> Come I on, Dave. Say, well, Dan's slightly more qualified. But uh, I, I kept getting promoted because I was willing to do it and figure it out. And people were confident that I could do it. And uh, and it also learned early on that you can't do it yourself. You do it because you get uh, trust and confidants, you work with people, you help them make the right decision, and I, one of the things that I learned was just how to work with a lot of people and get them going in the right direction, and uh, that's, that's been my career. So it's, it was definitely learned very early on that you don't have to have all the answers. Somebody does, and if you try something that doesn't work, if it doesn't kill you, you get another chance. So that, that's what I learned. And I would add to that and say that we learned self-reliance um, because things were breaking constantly on the boat. And uh, we lost our steering, which you'll learn about. We lost, um, there's, there's a lot of loss. <laughs> a lot of things broken. Um, and then you have to, and when you're in the middle of the ocean, you can't call anyone. You can't, you either fix it or you do without. Um, and so that, we just learned that first having built the boat, installing the engine, installing, building everything, we knew it inside and out. But um, I carry that today. You know, you just break down problems. And uh, when the, um, the sewer guy came recently and told me it was going to be $40,000 for him to fix, I said, thank you very much. And I said, where would you start to dig? And he drove off and I started digging. And I solved the problem. So that's how, that's how we roll. So, if you have a super problem, please call me. <laughs> Okay, you shouldn't tell this story. <laughs> <laughs> but I see how you were confident. You were confident that you know, he knows where he is, he knows how to get home. So Elaine and I were hired to um, watch her wayward son, I mean your son, Miles. <laughs> and, Did you have other sons at the time? No, there was only one that was there. Really? And Scott says your husband is going on tour. And then, so we had one job, really, to watch Niles. And so Niles went by to Dad, and they went in his room, went out the window, and we didn't see Niles for two days. <laughs> yeah, we never saw him. We, so, and we didn't get hired back, but uh, we love Niles. And today, he's around the corner from you. Yes, he is. Well, I think it's time for you to go into time. your presentation. And when they are finished with that, we will have time for Q&A. So I'm going to wander over here. So Wings of the Morning is the name of the boat. Um, and we, it's a very important for those boaters, you know, a lot of thought goes into naming the boat. Up to this point, the name of the boat was going to be Island Girl. <laughs> the had no four teenage boys. <laughs> but then my sister, Deb, this was the, one of the first important things she gave to us was the, the idea of the name because it, it, Dave and I were going back and forth. I think it was a youth pastor who had a speedboat named Wings of the Morning. Is that right? No, you're... My college roommate. Go college roommate. So we contacted them and said, would you mind if we use this? But it's from the Bible. It says Psalms 139. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall hold me and thy right hand... No, even there... I, my hand will, do, I, what is do, it? Do we have a pastor in the house? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jim, uh, it's something, yeah. You were doing great. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, and that, so that became the name of the boat, Wings of the Morning. Um, 
And another thing that Deb provided for us was one of our partners, because she was dating Carrie, Carrie Milger at the time, and then Carrie started hanging out with us. So I like to say we stole Carrie from my sister, stole her boyfriend, so thank you for that. And then, most importantly, she gave us the book Dove, the book uh, about Robin Graham, who was 16 when he sailed around the world um, alone. And so we were so inspired by that. So Deb, thank you for that. Let's see here. What's happening? Here. Yeah. So there's the boat. That's the boat when we were um, coming home from, we just left Hawaii. But we'll tell you more. So this was a horrible picture that Deb was mortified. Uh, this is Deb and Dave and me in the tub, and Deb was teaching us water safety. <laughs> So, and this is my dad um, on our first boat, which is a, a raft, a rickety raft, and uh, that, that's, is that safe? I don't think that that would be safe, but that's Deb and her, and her brothers, Dave and me. You know, I guess I'm not, oh, so the, we had an affinity of water, and you're probably saying, what's happening here? I'll explain, so there was this river, and there was a rope across it, and there was a raft on one side, we thought, how cool would that be? And so, and it worked every time when we were practicing, but then, so this is me, and this is Dave, and you can you just read the faces, so. <laughs> I'm doing something wrong here. Okay, so, we loved water. This is, uh, we were up in Rosario. My dad had chartered a boat and took the family up, and so that's Dave and me, and then Dale over there, and we just wanted to be around the water, I mean, fishing, boating, and so this is just a view. As David mentioned that we built a boat when we were 13, so this was the boat that was, we bought the plant for $2, um, and this is a maiden voyage, so this beautiful sail is plastic, it's a tarp, and that's a duct tape, um, and moments later, we flipped the boat, and the most important part of the boat, all this, sunk to the bottom of the lake. So that was our maiden voyage. <laughs> and interestingly, Vern Morgan, the master diver who became such an important part of this, he taught diving, so he had his dive class come out and search as if it was a body to try to find it, they never did find it. So then we got a Hobie 14, that was our next boat. Those of you who boat know that you're always looking for the next bigger boat. I just want to tell another Dale story here. So um, we got a Hobie 14, and so then Dale, younger brother, got a Hobie 16. And then we got a Kettenberg 32. And Dale, how big was your Kettenberg? Yeah, no, this was a Rhodes. Not a Rhodes 33. Oh. In high school, a Rhodes 34. But then you got a Kettenberg 50. Yeah, okay, so there's a little competition there. <laughs> anyway, so this was the boat that we were on when we decided we were going to go to Tahiti. Uh, but you can see that it's probably not an ocean-going boat and why we couldn't take that boat. Mm. So you've heard the story about we're going to Tahiti, we're shouting that. So and then we decided that since we can't afford to buy a boat, you build one. And so this is what I was describing. So this is the boat shop, and this is Vern. Oh, I have a little pointer here. This is Vern Morgus, and he thought um, fiberglass was the coolest thing ever. If he had a problem with his shoe, a hole in his shoe, he had fiberglass around it. Every, every gardening tool was replaced, you know, was repaired with fiberglass. And so, he, it's a miracle product. So what we're doing here, we've already painted our boat. We painted first the release coat, and then you paint the, paint, you paint it white. And so, here we are, we've got these wide, um, any of these have done fiberglassing, they're about 50 inches wide and it's um, fabric, basically, fiberglass fabric, and then you use a petroleum resin that you catalyze with catalyst, and so you roll these things up and you go back and forth and you're building your, your boat. And so this is Carrie and me standing in the keel, um, and so this is Dale, Dale later became a Boeing engineer. So you can see he's inspecting this. So there's a little foreshadowing there. Um, 
And then what I'm doing is, this is in the keel. For those of you sailing, you know you have to have ballast. We needed 8,000 pounds of ballast. And so we, the lead is expensive. And so we thought, where can you get, this is when we'd be just scrappy thinking about, we didn't want to write a check to anyone. So uh, what we ended up doing is Marty's dad had a garage, and he said, well, they use uh, lead for balancing tires, and we have buckets of those. Okay, go to every gas station. And then, um, I had, um, we had a friend who was a radiologist and he, we were talking with him and he said, well, we use um, uh, lead casings for the radioactive isotopes. And I said, do you have any of those? He said, we have a closet full. Can we have them? And so we were melting all this here. And then the most creative was, where else do you have lead? Well, the shot from a gun. And so we went to the abandoned, uh, we got permission from the superintendent to go to the abandoned rifle range underneath the gymnasium. And, uh, and we set up these sifts and we would take it and we would shove this and we collected all the shot and we put it in barrels of water so the lead would sink to the bottom and all the wood. Anyway, and then we would sit here and melt lead. So what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I've got a good story to tell on that. So what can go wrong is that if water gets down below, because it doesn't, it's not perfectly solid uh, lead, we put a lot of iron in there too. So water settles in there, and then you put molten lead on top of that, it explodes. And so oh, that it, happened. It exploded and we turned and lead was just lead foil in the back of the person that was manning the, the, the lead pod. So. And then but back to when you're fiberglassing, so you keep it cold in the boat house while you're doing the fiberglassing and then you, um, because you want it to kick, it has to harden, so then you build this big fire in this stove made out of a 55, 55 gallon drum. So we did that and then we got a call from Vern at like one in the morning. Um, and he chewed us out because the boathouse was on fire. It was, and the flames were running up the wall. So you can see that we started putting, roughing everything into plywood, and this is the um, hatch to the uh, engine room, so we're in the cockpit here. And then we're fiberglassing the superstructure, and you can see how when you break the mold part, um, then you've got, you know, it's one boat, it's like a big swimming pool. So oh then it, it came out of the uh, boathouse, and down here is water, and this is where there was another one of these hulls being built. They were much further along, so we would run down and measure something or get ideas from them. Um, and then what we've done is this has been built on a big trailer on logs with pipes underneath it. I never understood exactly what that was for, but you'll see why. I learned, and you're gonna learn why that was. So then it was, we had to launch it. So we had this, um, Marty Ray's dad had this old rickety truck, tow truck. And so, so the, the, here's the concept is we're gonna roll this down and then we have these, it was built on these, we put planks down and these logs, major timbers, were sitting on pipes. And so the idea was that you would, you know, with a come along, crank it down, and then it would just go down and sit on the beach, and then we would wait, wait for the tide to come in. That didn't happen. So it, uh, the cable broke and it crashed on its side. And so what had happened, this is a, sort of a favorite picture because right now we thought that our entire dream has crashed, and it, you know, that it's ruined the hull, uh, the water's gonna be coming in. Um, and Dale, the inspector, he's the first one right there to, to go in and check out the damage. Um, you can't see one expression. You know what's really interesting is my you dad took movies. movies. My dad was taking movies as his whole thing. And then when this thing crashed, he thought his sons were crushed underneath it, so it immediately stops. Whoops. Okay, so then... So we took the opportunity because the tide comes in slowly, so we washed, the, I mean, we painted the bottom and we had to put these, um, the portholes in and then we got towed to the, to the marina. So this was um, the christening and this is our pastor, Pastor Ken Robinson, and right over here, Carrie, with the big thing on his, 
Um, we didn't sleep the night before because we were trying to get ready for this, and so we worked through the night, and he was, because we were going to have all these people come aboard, and he ran his hand through a planer. Oh, and so man. he's drugged up there. He'd just come out of the hospital. I mean, it was, they were able to reattach the fingers. So that's looking inside. That's the galley and the chart table, just to give you a feel for that. We won't go into the whole thing about living aboard and going to school, and that's when I met this girl, very cute girl, in the animal behavior lab, <laughs> Elaine, and my opening line was, you want to be rat partners? And she said yes, and we've been together for how many years, 44 years? Um, so then we departed, and I want to point out just a couple things here. One is, um, so this is a cutter rig. Um, so this has two sails up here. It, you, many people are familiar with sloop rigs, so it's a mast, a mainsail, and then a headsail. So we have a club footed, there's a boom there. Um, normally you would have uh, a dodger, which is, uh, gives you some protection, but we couldn't afford a dodger. You would also see somebody going um, offshore, they would have self-steering gear, but we couldn't afford self-steering gear. So what this meant is that we would have to have someone at the helm 24-7. Was there a captain and first mate, or? Dave? That is a very logical question. And uh, we, we actually had a, uh, you'll meet him in a minute. Uh, well, uh, his name was uh, uh, John, John Erickson. Erickson. He'd been in the Navy as a navigator and uh, was a friend of the family. And he offered to go with us to teach us navigation at least to San Francisco. And uh, so being in the Navy, the first question was the one you just asked. So which one of you is the captain? And we all said, we're all the captain. And he went, oh my God, <laughs> what am I getting myself into? He, wrote, he was a writer and he wrote several articles uh, and they were always called the four captains because he could not get over the idea that, uh, and the way it worked was if you were at the helm, you got to make all the calls. You knew more about the conditions, you knew that we needed to do a sail change and nobody questioned the decision of the captain at the helm. But after that, everything was decided as a committee and it's another one of those things that I learned on the way uh, through, through my career, you've got to get along. You've got to come to some conclusions when you've got different varying opinions. And uh, so there were no captains. But what could possibly go wrong? You'll find out. <laughs> and the last thing, oh, I want to go back to, uh, I want to introduce you to our little dinghy. So you need a dinghy because you have to anchor out and that's the way you get to and from you. Um, so we're going to see that in a minute. So there's, there's John Erickson, old man in the sea, who taught us how to celestial navigate. The um, insurance people who gave us the life insurance and the blue water insurance said, we need to have somebody who knows what they're doing because the four of us had never been on the ocean before. In the boat we built. Why would they give us insurance? Anyway, so they said if you bring a, a, a knowledgeable seafarer who will acknowledge that the boat is seaworthy and that you all know what you're doing, then we'll go ahead and issue the policy. So he sailed with us to San Francisco and then he, you know, convinced them that we were good to go. He ran. So, <laughs> do you want to describe the sextant and what we're doing there? So, this is, uh, this is a sextant. And this was one of the most important uh, pieces of equipment we had on the boat. And with this, you can do uh, a sunshot. You you wait till it's noon, exactly noon, and you you have a very accurate watch, and you have a sextant and uh, tables in these books that will tell you basically through triangulation where you are. Some they give you a good idea of where you are. Uh, that in connection with. Uh, this, this is a taffle log, and it's got a little propeller, and it gets, you drag that behind the boat, and it, as it spins, it twists the rope connected to it, and it gives you how many nautical miles you've gone. And so we were on, at first we were on four hour watches, you'd steer for four hours. We did it in teams because we were too afraid to be out there ourselves. And uh, you, at the beginning of the watch, you would read the log book and see what the conditions were like before you went up. 
put your life harness on, go up and start steering, and you would always, at the end of your watch, you'd see how many miles you've gone, record them in the logbook, what the, what the course you were steering, what the weather conditions were. And uh, so, basically, those are all you needed, and the same thing that Captain Vancouver and, uh, you know, any one of the explorers had some version of the same thing. Saturn now existed at the time, but it was very expensive. We couldn't afford it. So, Dave. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to read from my log book. Just, uh, and just don't judge me. I was 20 years old when I was writing this. And uh, so you can't see the misspelled words, but you asked a great question. Were you ever afraid? I don't think we were afraid enough, but this is one, this is at first. I think we were more afraid when we didn't. At the very beginning, when we were just a bunch of boat builders trying to learn how to sail, and we took off down the Straits of Juan de Fuca, what could possibly go wrong? Well, we took a big wave on the stern of the boat, and the cold sea water went up and crystallized the valve and the engine, so we sailed into Anacortes. We took the engine apart, took bus rides to Seattle to get the part. Seven days later, we were on our way again. And then we, we went out, and we, we were just amazed at how how beautiful it was out there. We're going right at the mouth of the Straits of Juan de Fuca, heading out, kind of high-fiving, kind of cursing to see all the things that made John, John Erickson cringe as a seaman. And uh, we went out there, all got seasick, hit a storm, had to come back into Nia Bay, waited in Nia Bay until, the until it cleared a little bit and off we went. So this is on September 4th, 1979. Uh, let's see, I'm not gonna read too much of it. The weather got stormier as the, day, as the day inched on, so we decided to put into Grace Harbor. The catch was we were over 30 miles out to sea and had had a good fix for almost 24 hours. So we DR, DR means dead reckoning, and you just uh, basically know what direction you've been going for how long, try to estimate the amount of current might set you, so we knew generally where we were. DRing is guessing, uh, basically. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Until, until we uh, radioed a tug for our position, Marty also made several calls to the Grace Harbor Coast Guard for bar conditions, etc. I was, I was tired and wet and ready for anything that would just stop, stand still. And for a second, when Marty told me uh, we just weren't going to be able to make the Grace Harbor, make the Grace Harbor and head her out back to sea. I was totally distraught and questioned the decision, but no, he was right. The sea seemed to steepen, and the rain and the wind seemed to in increase by the minute. Marty laid in the cockpit with his head down and would hold, at, hold, hold on at my announcement of a cresting swell. That, deci that decided to come aboard. It was the first time I ever had reasonable concern for the lives of the crew and the safety of wings. I was scared. It was black, the winds were blowing over 40, it was pouring rain, the seas were high and cresting. I was tired, wet, and praying. 10 minutes before shift changed, the winds died to almost nothing. I was happy to turn the shift over to Dan, since I had been at the helm for four hours, through Marty's shift also. Down below, the ladder was down, and the boat a moving river of loose gear, but it was warm and dry, and it wasn't my worry if the cockpit filled or the bow stayed into the swells, I was going to bed. <laughs> I was um, really suffering from seasick, spent a lot of time laying out there on the, when I'm not at the helm and just vomiting. And um, I came down soon after and said, you guys, I'm off. I'm in San Francisco, I'm out. And they just started cracking up. <laughs> no, I'm out. And so, I made it, but when I started feeling better. So here we are, um, there's the Golden Gate Bridge, and there's John, this is the last time you're gonna see him. And this is Carrie, and that's Marty. And this is, um, our helm is hydraulics, so, so that's, that's an important thing to remember. Um, and so there, this is considered wing and wing, so this is how when the wind's at your back, this is how you sail. There's wings of the morning. Dave? So, uh, it was, I remember reading the log, I tried to read it for the last two weeks, well, just to kind of prepare for this, and uh, we were, it was, it would go from, we're gonna sell the boat, 
to this is the best thing that we've ever done. And usually that's within 24 hours. So we were cruising um, and uh, there's, we were down in the Channel Islands and Channel Islands are just off of California and we, it was spectacular, porpoises and everything. We found this phenomenal anchorage, clear water, dropped the anchor, and we had a spear gun that was given to us as a gift, a going away gift. And so we had dive gear and we, we dived and it was spectacular. We just kept, I mean the fish were everywhere. And then we later found out that uh, it was a, a sanctuary, a like safe <laughs> sanctuary. We were basically so hunting so in a zoo. <laughs> Now, we thought, one looks pretty cool. Well, that's the state fish. Yeah, this is a state fish. So, <laughs> we're going to destroy these slides yeah. right after this. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, did, I, did we miss a slide? Channel Islands. So, what happened is um, that. That's the part. Keep going. Um, well, the reason we came into San Diego. Uh, in part was because that any I introduced you to, we lost it at sea. We went out, it was gone. We don't, doesn't matter whose fault it was, it was a non or a large shark, but somehow we were trailing it, so now we couldn't continue on the trip until we figured it out. And we, I think we've impressed upon you already, we had no money. So now we stayed in San Diego and we were working to earn enough to get a new um, dinghy, which was an Avon, an inflatable. So we did that, we earned enough to get a sailboard as well, and uh, we were off. So we made it down, it took us about a week to get to Cabo San Lucas, and I don't know if any of you have been there um, recently, but it doesn't look like this. There were three hotels, um, and there were um, three hotels, one bakery, and one school. And we would always connect um, with the youth wherever we went and had basketball games. And so we tried to let them win so they wouldn't beat us. <laughs> um, so then we, oh yeah, so then that new dinghy we had, we lost that one. <laughs> So we decided not even to tell our parents because we should they're going to told them. I mean, why do we? I can't believe we told you. So we lost another one, brand new dinghy. We don't know if it was stolen or whatever. It was just tied up to our boat. Um, and then I also got uh, amoebic dysentery, and so I was sick for like a week, 102 fever, vomiting, diarrhea, and so really prepared well for a 30-day passage in the ocean where I'm going to be seasick. I actually thought for a minute this would be the end of me. So, um, but of course we thought, let's go. I'll take this one. Uh, so when we left. Uh, we were, there was a little bit of a fear of running out of water because we were going a long way and there was no faucets out there. And so we filled the tanks up, we filled the sink with water, every jerk jug, everything we could do, we, we got water, we, we took off. And the conditions were, were pretty light at first. The idea is it's about 3,000 miles and you're going to cross the equator. And so north of the equator, you have the northerlies, you've got the winds going one direction, and when you go to the south of the equator, they go another direction. Uh, I'm going to read one more uh, because, so when we were boat builders learning how to sail, now it's been four months, we kind of know a little bit more what we're doing. And so here is a passage where the conditions are worse and we're not afraid. Uh, when I took the helm, the winds were blowing over 40 knots and the seas towering over 15 feet. Uh, Dan sat with me the first two hours in, in the light rain and heavy seas, trying to capture the chaos on film. He went down below and the storm reached an ugly crescendo, one I wouldn't care to ever see again. The seas built until they were two-story buildings and cresting. The rain sounded like thunder as it pounded on the waves and deck dumping literally inches of water per minute. The visibility was 200 yards at best the sky and ocean blending into an ominous gray, ominous gray and gray and white. The wind had to, to have gusted near 50 as the sails sounded as if they would be dashed to ribbons by the wind. The rain and the wind seemed to flatten the smaller waves as lines of white spindrifts laced the waves that were piling up on each other. The ocean can be the most ugly and menacing place on earth. The motion down below wasn't much better. 
as a colossal wave would roll wings on her side, sending her rails awash. I shivered in the cockpit the last half hour of my shift, welcoming the warm spray of a wave that happened aboard. I wasn't scared. I wasn't scared once, and wings handled the seas commendably. Only a few times did I think about the life raft, and only as my mind raced from thought to thought. If you listen hard while I am on watch during the heavy weather, you will always hear the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> so, so these are some pretty heavy seas you can see, and um, we were, I always had a line in, we didn't catch very many fish, but we were finally trolling at a speed that the uh, tuna were biting, so we, that was scary. There's a little bit of what it looks like in below. And then we uh, celebrated Christmas at sea. I'm making a Christmas tree out of a green fishing line. <laughs> and just a little bit about what life is like out there. Do you want to take the land home? What's your time check? Oh, it's horrible. We are. So we're going to have to pick it up. Should we just? We'll just keep going. This was uh, probably the high of the whole trip, was hitting landfall in Nukahiva in the Marquesas because we traveled 3,000 miles and we found it and it was, it was, everyone was just sort of speechless. Um, so later, uh, here we met uh, Gary Williamson, he was on the Sea Star, which was a boat you paid to be on and they ended up being with Captain Bly. So he saw us come in and he said, I'm gonna hook myself to that wagon. And so you'll see him, so there's Gary. There he is. Do you wanna say a quick yeah. story about Mrs. Carter? Yes, yeah, so um, when we landed on Nukahiva, there's several bays and there's the main bay. These, I think that there's a dirt road that's about a quarter of a mile long. That's the only road on, on the whole island. There was a, a grass runway uh, up on the top of the mountain, and uh, you would scramble down this trail if you ever took a flight in. So this is really something. So we, we walked up this mud road uh, up into the jungle, and uh, we ran into uh, this woman. She uh, spoke Polynesian and French, neither language to which we spoke, but we were able to communicate. And uh, we, uh, she, we were just chatting with her and uh, she was showing us how to husk the coconuts. And so we went up there looking for fruit and, and anything. And we, she ended up giving us two, two big bunches of bananas, I think uh, 20 coconuts, 50 limes, and uh, we all gave her a, a kiss on the cheek on the way back. And then we came back to see her the next day and, and, and brought her some, some popcorn or some of the things that she was very likely didn't have. So really nice um, experience. So we're gonna, we're gonna move more quickly. Barbers look different in the South Pacific. <laughs> Dave? So we had the opportunity, one of the boats that was in uh, the harbor in, in, near Nukahiva was uh, this research vessel and it had seven, it had scientists from seven different countries and they would go out to just tag the tuna and then they would, uh, so they would spray, you can see the water sprayed out there and that gets them into like a feeding frenzy and then you take these barbless hooks and just dangle them right in the water, right near the spring and the fish just bite the, uh, the, the hook. So no, no, uh, no bait at all on it. You would actually swing the, the, sink, the uh, tuna over, and there's a scientist right here, and he had a, uh, a tape cord around his neck, and they would lay him in this, they'd measure him, they'd weigh him, they'd tag him, and then throw him back in. And so uh, once we did that, we did that for a full day. Anytime we came into the harbor again, they would always bring us tuna that they had. If it, if it uh, hit the deck, uh, they, they couldn't. They couldn't send it back overboard, so they, we would get those when we were in the in the harbor. So we went to Uapua, which was another island, and this father and son came up and invited us to their house. <coughs> this is their house. It was a corrugated aluminum um, roof, three sided, and just super humble. Um, and 
we were uh, admiring shells that they had, and they, of course, then handed us those shells and insisted that they would, we would take those because we showed an interest and it's a custom. So then the next day they came down to our boat and they were showing great interest in our radio. And, uh, so, we were, so we gave them some baseball caps. <laughs> So uh, Tahiti was the destination, and we finally, finally got, we were coming into the harbor. It was kind of overcast, and we, it wasn't, you know, we imagined the Tahitian women kind of rowing and paddling out to the boat, and sun and everything, but it, was, it, it wasn't happening quite like that. So we round the harbor, and uh, Papiete is a pretty, uh, pretty neat French city. And uh, so we were coming in, and there's a, a three-masted uh, training vessel there, and one of our friends, Gary, that was you were introduced to, he was at the top mast of this, and he was waving at us because he was thinking in his head, "I got to get on that boat." And so, also on the Sea Star where Gary was on, there was Martin and Karen. They also wanted to get on our boat. Gary and Martin didn't talk, so Gary's scrambling down to try to get to his first, and he sees Martin dive in the water because, and, and take, our, take our stern line because down there you anchor your bow, you take the stern line to the shore and you tie it up so all of them are, are tied stern too. And Martin swimming out there took our line and we're going, this is the most awesome place we've ever been. So, and then but, Gary pushed ahead yeah. of him and said, hey, can I take you guys out for hamburgers? And so he took us for hamburgers. Gary then moved on to the boat and he stayed with us for four months while we were in. And then later... I was in his wedding. I was there at his house when he had his first babies. Yeah, so... He beat yeah. us off. Okay, so just a quick story here. We decided we'd travel around the uh, island of Tahiti on mopeds. And uh, we didn't pay attention to how far it was. It was like 70 or 80 miles. And these don't get, go very fast. And so it got very dark. And so we decided that we would just sleep right here. And then these coconuts started falling from the trees. And so we just put our helmets on and just uh, curled up. Problem solved. Yeah, problem solved. <laughs> so then we came upon this um, uh, little community, and this is how they, they put the nets out, and the entire community comes down and brings the nets in together, from little kids to older um, people. And one of the most memorable, and I couldn't find the slide, is the women with bathing suit tops or just brassiers, they would take the fish, catch this squirming fish, put them in their top, and so we have, they'd have like eight squirming fish as they could have both hands to work. And, uh, so we were in the midst of this helping them. It was, okay. I know this is a disturbing picture and you should probably look away, but um, I traded that group of fish for her skirt and top. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, once you've been down there for a long time, you start to look more like the natives. <laughs> that is disturbing. You're going to be haunted by that. Okay. So, the diving was spectacular. Um, that picture right there. We used the uh, sailboard to go to go to another boat. So I have Crisco there that I went shopping to another boat because I was making a pie for our 21st birthday. So we, we were in, we were in uh, French Polynesia for about four months and one day we just decided, I think we're done. We don't need to dive anymore. We don't need to windsurf anymore. And we wanted to go home. So uh, on the way to Hawaii, we stopped at Rangaroa. And uh, atolls, I'm, you're, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with it. If you're on a boat, all you see are these little islands that just look like individual islands. From the air, you can see that there's uh, the water passes over them and it fills the lagoon. And these lagoons can be tens, 20, 30 miles across. But all the water that comes in has to go out. So every, every one of them has a pass, and I, you can see the pass right up there. And what's interesting about those is that there's quite a bit of current that can run through them, and they attract all the large fish that are out in the ocean because current is where the bait is. And so in those passes, sharks, 
um, manta rays, all these huge type of creatures. And we had um, at different um, parties around the campfire, we heard tales that there were these giant manta rays. They were like with 12 or 15 foot wingspan that you could ride them. And we, we all agreed that if we ever had that opportunity, we would ride them. Would, yes, we would. We could do it. And so, this is what one looks like. That's about 12 feet from wing to wing, and that mouth is about three feet wide. And so, I got the short straw. So, what we're seeing here, just to, is uh, this is the shadow of the manta ray, not expecting what's about to happen. <laughs> so, this is me in, in uh, midair, and this is me on top of the manta ray. <laughs> We can get arrested for this now, but, uh, but they, the manta rays learned real quick. You hear the motor, and then something large jumps on your back. So, you hear the motor, and you go really deep. So, <laughs> so uh, it was about just under 3,000 miles north that, uh, to, to Hawaii, and uh, the weather, we had more good weather than bad weather going up there. Uh, just, I, I've said that the best the best moments of my life and the worst moments of my life, up to this, up to marrying my wife, of course, was uh, was on the water. You'd have terrifying times in the storm, and at night, stars all out from from horizon to horizon, the phosphorescence in the water. It's uh, just spectacular. So what happened is, if you remember the wheel, I mentioned that it was hydraulics. Well, the hydraulics failed. So basically, Dave was on watch, and I was reading the log book, or the ship's log from, uh, from Carrie. And Carrie said, oh, the wheel is slipping some. And so then it totally failed, so we had no steering. That's a problem when you're in the middle of the ocean. Now, luckily, Vern Morgus said you always have to have a backup plan. So we had, uh, we've been carrying this big tiller, and a tiller is a big stick, basically, with a fitting that fits on top of the rudder post. And so it's one thing to have that in a small boat. It's another thing to use a tiller to steer a 40-foot boat. And so this is Eric, the Viking tiller that we have right here. And so, uh, so that's how, and we've got, oh, we're gonna have to, that's what uh, Marty's doing, he's standing behind, and so th that's how we went. We thought, we, we're gonna have to do this for 1,800 miles, and so we did, and we made our way to Hawaii, um, and then Elaine, um, we contacted Elaine, and she went to the manufacturer and got a new pump for us, and she agreed to come out and deliver it. Thank you very much. And so this is, we're on the boat, and there's Elaine. Um, thank you, Elaine. And there we are because it was the wrong pump. So, so we ended up using Eric the Viking Tiller all the way back. From, so now we had another 3,000 miles to go from Hawaii back to Washington. So um, there you can see Dave is actually with Eric right here. There's the tiller, um, the sailboard. And we had just left uh, the Big Island. On our, I guess it was, yeah, Big Island on our way home. Who took the picture? <coughs> There's more of a story than you really want to, but I'm going to say this. Um, we were contacted by um, a group who wanted to do a documentary. And so they flew a crew out, interviewed us, and took all this film, and took out these aerials. Um, the documentary never happened, but um, I ended up buying all the film from the guys for 300 bucks. So anyway. We have we have great movies and and so that's party. Our, that's a that's a fishing uh, glass fishing ball, a Japanese fishing ball. Uh, there's a small one that we found also out there. You look for them; they don't float on the top of the water. They're drugged down by seaweed and barnacles and everything. But if you look for just an obscure thing floating right in the water, and so we found a number of those. And then just a couple days out of the Straits of Juan de Fuca, we noticed um, these two whales, and they, we, we thought, that's awesome, and I'm taking the, the, the film of them coming, and they were on a collision course. I mean, they're going to ram us. Um, and so they've just, at the bow, they dive down underneath the boat and come up in our wake. And there we are, made it back. And uh, this was our route. Then, um, so this has ended up being 14,000 miles. You can, see the, um, you can see that we were near the Galapagos. We were um, 
also Australia, but we only had a year. We were ready to go home. And then we went back. Uh, that was, that's Gary, Dave, and me. Um, we went back in 2020, 2019, um, after 40 years later, and visited all the places, chartered a, a trimaran, visited all the islands, and it's shocking how little had changed, really. So. My, my wife, Shelly, who's here, said, uh, uh, so we were in a charter, they call it a bear boat, where you just charter the boat, they give you the, the keys and say, this is how, how the head works. And uh, she said, nah, you know, why don't we get a captain? So we had a captain boat, and we did the cooking, and it was, uh, it was a really good idea. <laughs> She'd heard the stories. I think we're out of time, aren't we? It's time for Q&A. Do you want me to just handle the microphone? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, does anybody have a question? Yeah. How did you gradually learn how to sail? Well, I, I think that we learned to sail when we were, when we started, when we built the boat at 13. Then when we got the, so sailing, we had sailing down. We didn't have ocean navigation and ocean seamanship. And that we just learn by making every mistake possible. Um, Another question? I'll get back to you. I'm going to go front first. Hey, great presentation. Um, from each of your perspectives, what was your most important personal item that you had with you on the trip? Mine was the logbooks. Log you know, yeah. I, uh, it used to be historically, uh, Ships that uh, that were out exploring, they required everybody that could write to keep a logbook, and that's the owners of the ship because they could, if the boat was scuttled, if it was if it was pirated or whatever, and honestly, that was the most valuable thing. I think it got more value as I stayed disciplined enough to write it every time. But that was my, I would say that was my second. The sextant was my most prized possession, <laughs> because I didn't want to spend the rest of my life out there. Um, what's interesting is all four partners wrote in their logbooks daily, and there was one rule on the boat, and that was you would never read somebody else's log, because that's what you're seeing. He's breathing that way just to drive me insane. And so um, I ended up with all the logbooks, and I still, and, um, Two years ago, I got back in touch with Carrie, and I met him at a party, and I handed in the logbooks with the promise I'd never peeked inside, and I still have Marty's. So, anyway. Did you ever look? I did not look. <laughs> I did not look. Any other questions? Just one second. Uh, one second. I sailed down with the safety of down to San Francisco. <laughs> and one thing we found very valuable was a thing called a radio direction finder. Did oh, you yeah. ever have that? We did have an RDF, yeah. So radio direction finders, these are very sophisticated technology at the time. They basically were, it was a radio, just an AM, FM radio, with an antenna that moved, you could move. And so it would go, whenever the radio got the strongest signal, it would point the direction of where land was. I mean, it was really pretty basic. Did, and now, that may not be as accurate as, as you could give, but they were not, they basically used radio signals to keep up with your location, but it was uh, only work when you could get uh, w w within 20 or 30 miles of, uh, of land. A lot of our equipment did not work. We had a $3,000 single sideband radio that never worked. So when we would come into port and we would radio home, we'd go aboard a boat with a ham radio. They would contact another ham radio operator in the U.S. who would then contact the operator and then my mom would answer the, the soup can with the, you know, the no but tongue. And so we would call and I remember that was a very emotional call we made when we made it to the Nihiva. And then I usually was the one who would call. And then Dale, who was known for poking the bear, said, Dave's dead. Because we haven't heard from Dave. And mom and dad had a big chart of map where we are. And so then I called after that kind statement, my mom, I said, Mom, it's, it's Dan. Put Dave on. <laughs> yes. Two, two questions. What did you do with the boat at the end of your trip and those loans you took out? Did those ever get paid off? <laughs> this answer will answer both of those. So when we got back, 
we went back to the U, we were all going to the University of Washington, our two partners moved off, and then Dave and I bought them out. So now we were just on the boat, um, and then what we decided, because we were looking for the next project, we found a boat project that somebody had started, a larger boat, and they, we traded them. So they gave us $50,000, and we paid off our loan on the boat. They sailed off on Wings of the Morning, and then we had this unfinished boat, and then we set up a boat building company and built a 42-foot west sail. And Gary was one of the partners in that, JWJ Marine Enterprises. I, I have a question back here. Okay. What did you eat for food? Was it fish? Did you fish the whole time, or did you bring a bunch of top ramen? You know, <laughs> um, the provisioning is something that is, there's, there's books written about provisioning. And Elaine was here when we decided, oh my God, we haven't bought any food. So we went down the store and we stood in the parking lot and said, we're going to be gone a year, right? 365 breakfasts, 365 lunches, and 365 dinners. So we just started getting cases of, hey, they put a whole chicken in this. Okay, so we got cases of whole chicken and ravioli and pasta and we just, and soup, and we just kind of loaded the boat. And so what happened is, in those books that we didn't read, they tell you how you need to label the cans, and we didn't, so uh, all the labels went off, and so they'd say, Dan, what's for dinner? And I'd say, I'd open it up, uh, peaches, <laughs> beans, and peaches. And so that's kind of how, how it rolled. And then without any money, you know, we'd go into port and you'd go to the bakery and we would get what we called stomach plug, which were baguettes. They were inexpensive and they just stopped the hunger. We made a lot of pancakes, you know, things that, you know, just, we, we were, were hungry. We were really hungry most of the time because this wasn't funded. Our parents weren't sending us money. We were working. And uh, so we ate a lot of baguette because it makes you full. <laughs> How deep was your draft? Got a motor. Technical question. It was, uh, wasn't it four, four, four feet, eight inches, inches I yeah. think. Yeah. Question over here. How long after you got home did you get back on the water? And do you sail now? Oh man, two good questions. Uh, how long did, was it before we got back on the water? Uh, it wasn't long because we lived on the boat. Uh, and uh, when we got back and we lived aboard for a couple of years and uh, I, I've had a boat most, I mean I have a boat right now, I don't, I'm a power boater now, uh, so you can get there faster. But, um, and I, I've got a, a boat I'm building in my garage, so I, I still have the boat. I love boating. More questions? <clears throat> what, what did you do after you lost the second inning? <laughs> Great question. So uh, we had to leave. We didn't have a boat. And so we ended up selling our dive gear. And so because we all we had, we just had the things we had on the boat. So we'd have to sell them. There was, there was no work. So we were able to get that rickety um, inflatable that we bought from someone. And then we had one oar. So before we could leave, we had to find another oar. And uh, so we were all, you know, at a search party to find, we got this. You know, it was a broken oar. We, broken we oar. actually sold the dive gear for five hundred dollars, and we were there was a boat that was going north that didn't uh, need their dinghy, so and they wanted five hundred dollars. So we got their boat, gave, uh, gave them five hundred dollars that we got from the dive gear. And they had one good oar, as Dan pointed out, and we went. We find, this was this happened the day before we were going to leave, and you can't leave without a dinghy, and uh, so. We went from fishing boat to fishing boat, finding out if they had a single oar, and there was one that was broken, so we fixed it and we took off. Ingrid, how tall is the mast? 50 feet. That's how we gauged the, the wave height, because we knew the mast was 50 feet, the spreaders were at 25 feet, they were five feet off, and that's, um, so you can get pretty decent at it. It's, it's kind of a rule, if you're cruising, you don't get the reputation for, for exaggerating because they're very likely been in the same storm and uh, so you really try to downplay what the, what, what the conditions were. I was just wondering if you had extra sails on board. We had uh, a set of sails that, you know, there was one picture where there were, um, 
you know, it was blue and white, so that was a drifter, so that was for light winds, and then we had the staysail, and then two different headsails, and then the main. But there was a moment when we were coming down the coast where there was a big wind, and there was a shock to the boat, and we heard this, um, these metal things sliding down. All of the slides on the sail had come up loose, and so we had to basically collect the sail, collect all those, and then hand tie all those back on, and then... We, we so. repaired the sails on the entire trip. I mean, as I'm reading the log, you know, when you when it got calm enough, you lower the sail a bit, and you would tie two or three more slides back on. So, you, you, you're kind of getting the drift here. Everything went wrong, and you try to figure it out, and just make your way to the next disaster. There's <laughs> one other comment real quick on the hunger. Dave, do you want to tell them about... We, we oh, yeah. lost the big island. We, we, we couldn't find the island. That's not very promising because I'm in charge of navigation. <laughs> that you know, we did, it was the largest island we went to, but it was because of where the sun was, we did most of our navigation using sun shots. And because the sun was right overhead, it didn't give us enough of an angle to be very accurate about where we were. So when we were coming up, we, we, th we weren't where we thought we were, and we started, then, this is not um, uncommon that you start losing your mind a little bit and you start going for clouds because they look like, generally a big cloud is going to be over an island, and so we start sailing from the cloud and then it goes away, God dang, we <laughs> And so, we, when we finally determined where we were, we had come up quite a bit south of where we thought we were, and we had to beat up to the very north end of, of, uh, of the big island so we could go to Hilo. And in celebration, we were finding the last cans of food we had. And we were eating everything we had, and, and we got kind of hungry. And I, I just read, just before we got there, Dan grabbed the two last cans of soup, and we had used all the fuel in the fuel tank, and we ladled out fuel out of the stove tank that's on the top of the deck that fed the uh, stove and oven down below, and we label it out into a jerry can, and so we had enough power to uh, get into the dock. So, so we had no fuel, no, no food, food, and no toilet paper. <laughs> so, so we were in bad shape. Anyway, you had a question. It looks like you've had uh, two sets of reefs on that? We did, yes. Okay. And how often did you have it not reefed? Not very often. <laughs> so the, the question was, um, Explain what so is. There's, you see these uh, lines hanging here, and there's a setup there, and then we have it reefed down here. So as the winds pick up, you don't want to have as much sail up because it ten pushes you over on your ear. So we have the first uh, reef, and so you basically lower the sail, and then you tie it around the bottom. And so you can sort of tell how high the winds are because if you're in, if you're double reefed or triple reefed, then you just have a handkerchief kind of enough to give you a little bit of stability. So, so yeah. that and this this um, stay sail right here was a much smaller triangle and it had a big boom on the bottom of it. That little one in the third reef is a small amount of sail that you would put up just to keep you steady. And that um, um, that boom on the stay sail boom. Somebody said, one of the most afraid I ever was, was there was, we jived in the unexpected turn, and Dave was on the deck, and it swept him, it hit him. <laughs> anyway, I thought it was over for Dave. And so and you, you, usually when you're out on the deck, on the ocean, you've got a life harness on, and it's, you're always connected to the boat. I went up there really quickly, didn't have a life harness on, get, got hit, knocked down by that, slid to the edge, but... We had the railing there that was... But I, um, I just saw him disappear. He went down, I just saw him disappear. And so it's stormy, and uh, it was a low moment. Uh, was there a question over here? Yeah. What was the longest period of time that you couldn't take a sighting of the sun, and what did you do in those circumstances to navigate? Okay, uh, that's a good question. If you're using the sun or the stars for telling where you are, how many days did we go without having that? Uh, my guess is that probably three or four days. Uh, and what you do, though, and that's why you keep a copious ship's log. And that's why every at the end of every ship, you write direction you were going, direction the wind was blowing, and how hard, uh, how many miles you went from the from the taffrail log right over there. And you'd say with this kind of set, 
these number of miles, you could kind of dead reckon and get there. Um, interestingly, uh, these, this, when you buy one of these, you get an extra one. And this is the extra one because um, when we got really going on that first passage down to the Marquesas, we were moving so fast that that was jumping out of the water and it looked like prey and the big, big fish bit it off. <laughs> It's crazy. Oh, the fly, flying fish. Uh, it was not uncommon to have flying fish when you were out there. You'd be, it'd be pitch dark at night. All you have is a red glow of the compass light. And uh, you get pinged in the head or pinged in the leg or whatever. And fish, to get out of the way of, of, of a predator, they, they yeah. jump and they land right on the dead. So uh, one watch, pitch black. I get hit in the crotch by a fast-moving fish. Hurt a lot, and bit, and I was startled, and then I just heard something flopping in the bottom of the cockpit. And I thought something terribly wrong. <laughs> very, very upsetting. Did the main mast ever fail? You know what? That was the only thing that didn't fail. The <laughs> main mass didn't fail. Interestingly, we designed this, or we, it was recommended to us. This was put on a t built on a tabernacle. Often when you've got a mass, it goes all the way through the hull and then steps right to the, because there's an enormous amount of pressure on that. We put a big a post down below and it stepped here and it had a big stainless steel uh, hinging system so if somebody ever bought the boat and wanted to go through, uh, you know, through Europe and they wanted to get under bridges, you could potentially. I would never want to put a 50-foot mast down that way, but uh, you could do that. And we did, we built the mast with instructions, but we, we did build the mast. Where's it all down? You know, we don't, um, we don't know. And I don't know, we don't really want to know because if it was like, wrecked or something in a boatyard in some place. We just have, you know, you just want to remember that girlfriend the way she was. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like, he did not no, say that. I didn't, I didn't change that. Uh, okay, yeah. Did you ever have to go up the mast? Yeah, all, look, all the time. Look, if you can see here, we've got uh, uh, the steps that go all the way up to the main spreaders, and we would, uh, that was kind of the first challenge was would we jump off of that, and of course we did that, but we had a bosun's chair, and a bosun's chair is a fabric chair, canvas chair, that you use to get up there. Yeah, we, we'd have to go up there, um, not often, but. But we would sit up on those spreaders, if, if people, if we were swimming, one person would be on the spreaders watching for sharks. Oh. And we learned later that you swim with the natives because when they're getting out of the water, you get out of the water. <laughs> I think they said at one point, don't worry, they, they just, they didn't just like white meat. <laughs> Good for you. We should be respectful of your time. Yeah, I mean, we'll stay here all night and answer questions. Do any of your kids sail or want to do adventures like what you guys have done? That's a really good question. Uh, do our kids sail and do they do, have they wanted to do any adventure like this? Well, first of all, I'd say no. They couldn't go. Um, all of that parenting. Now, I would say that uh, uh, my wife and I have three kids and one is in Alaska working on his PhD up there. Uh, my daughter, when she was 21, drove her car across the country to live in Baltimore uh, after getting her degree and then uh, our her twin uh, brother is in Colorado. And so they kind of have taken their own paths and, uh, but, and they all learned how to sail. They did all learn how to sail. And my daughter showed a glimmer, a fleeting glimmer of interest in sailing and that was gone. And my son never had any interest in that, so. Very I, smart boy. I didn't have to tell them if they asked to do something like this. Are you insane? <laughs> Like any normal parent would have. What's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, uh, we asked, I don't know if it's you or me, sometimes as you get older, you start to adopt stories. And so, uh, <laughs> both my parents have passed away. And my, it was just probably the last year of her life, and she wasn't well. And we asked um, mom. Uh, it was me. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a story. It's a story. So, well, no, I, we'd always assumed, because people would always say, how did your parents or how did your mother ever let you do that? And we always assumed, um, one, that she had a very strong faith and that she just really gave it up to God to watch over us. Um, and then we also thought that she really didn't understand exactly the danger. But um, I asked her just a couple of years before she passed, and she said, um, you know, your dad and I knew that it was likely that one or both of you wouldn't come home. I said, what? Are you let us go? And she said that you were, this had been your dream. We were not going to stand in the way of that. You spent three and a half years building this. Um, you had to go. And so we were not going to have that resentment. And so it was your, it was your journey. Um, but another memorable conversation we had with my dad, I think we were both there for this one. Dad sat us down, um, and this is, we had just finished the boat. And we were having, getting a little nervous about going because we'd never been in the ocean before. And a lot of people were coming up to us and saying, you know, you've got to do this. You've got to do it for me. I'd always dreamed of doing it, but I, I've lost the opportunity. So we were getting all this pressure from people. And Dad sat us down and said, you know, what you've done is incredible. You need to be very proud of that. If it's your dream to sail, you need to do that. But don't do it if it's somebody else's dream. So he kind of gave us permission not to go. But, uh, you know, I think most of you have heard this before, that if you ever uh, want to go set a goal, tell everybody you can about it, and they'll make you do it. And we grew up in a small town, 5,000 people. There was one newspaper, and it came out once a, once a week. Dan and I both worked at the newspaper for $2.10 an hour, putting it together. But they ran articles in the newspaper. And so people would come up that I really didn't know and say, you know, Good luck to you guys. You've got to do this for me. And so we're not going to go back and say, no, nah, we're not doing that. <laughs> Forget about it. How much harder would it be to do that by yourself? Oh, I think it would be unbelievable. Well, building the boat, there are a lot of people that try. The sailing. Oh, the sailing, there are a fair number of single handers out there. And uh, it would be, you wouldn't get in fights. Yeah? And uh, there would be enough for you. Uh, when you make a pie, you get to eat it all. But I, I think that it's just the loneliness. It was kind of lonely even being on the boat with all four of us. It was just kind of mind-numbing out there. So, uh, what was it? We just saw a movie. What was the movie of the 15-year-old? 14 like, yeah. What was that movie? It was um, True, true Spirit. Spirit. So it's a true story about a... Um, I think she was 15 or 16, Australian, and she sailed around the world, but without stopping at any port. And without help. She and without help. And so it was very inspiring. And Robin Graham, who inspired us, and we later met Robin, um, but Robin Graham, when he was 16, sailed around the world. We have the National Geographic back there. They covered that in three issues of National Geographic, his trip, and then uh, they also made a movie, Dove. And so that was the book that Deb gave us, and he really got us, you know, imagining that this would be possible.